The opening sequence of episode 19 is purely utilitarian this time around. Instead of trying to reframe something or anything like that, this one simply drops us right into where we left off, with Annie just beginning her onslaught of the scouts as they try to keep pushing forward. Which nicely leads us into the title of this episode, simply titled Bite. And unlike the super pragmatic opening, this one I think can be inferred a number of different ways. First off, the obvious. It's referring to Aaron's inner turmoil around whether or not he should transform as his comrades are giving their lives just to try to buy some time. As we've talked about before, there is already significance in Aaron's choice of transformation being a bite, as that comes right from his father, which then comes from Frida. But in this particular instance, I think it just neatly encompasses all of those doubts that would begin to swirl around this mission as things become more and more complicated, many of which, of course, simply stem from Erwin's secrecy. Secondly, there's Aaron's attempts to transform through, again, the same biting technique. We'll get to this later on, so just keep that in mind. And third, the bite also functions as a gesture of mutual respect, humility, and trust, which, again, we'll get to just a tad later on. Effectively, in all of these cases, the bite is a sort of a key, if you will, be it unlocking greater power or forging alliances. Moving into the episode itself, there too we pick up right where we left off, with Levi firing off the acoustic round and once again reminding everyone that their mission is to keep Aaron alive. That is it. They're not meant to fight, all they're supposed to do is keep him alive. We, of course, have now talked about this for over an hour, but from Aaron's point of view, it is only now that he begins to realize that this entire mission is in fact something much grander. He isn't just along for the ride because Levi would have to police him as per their agreement. There is something more going on here. And in a broader sense, I think this is another one of those don't meet your idols moment for Aaron. Thus far, from both the stories we've heard as well as what we've directly seen, the Levi Squad is far and away the most powerful group of scouts humanity has to offer. So understandably, Aaron begins to ask, wait, if you guys aren't stopping it, then who can? Just like with the Tribunal and just like with the whole cleaning up charade, Aaron's fantasies of the scouts being these legendary near-immortal heroes is being shattered. Because underneath that facade of triumph lies mountains and mountains of dead soldiers. Something that ties right back into episode 1, where we saw a very similar sight of Erwin's squad returning from a mission. These sacrifices happening right behind him is what it truly means to be a scout, and for Aaron, that is a very rude awakening. Though on the flip side, from the rest of Levi's squad, we see the complete opposite, as despite them too being kept almost entirely in the dark, they do not ask any questions, to the point that when Aaron justifiably asks, I just don't get why you don't explain, they respond by telling him that it's because Levi decided against it, period. As we saw before the mission began, for this squad, Levi's word is law, and that is only exacerbated when they're out in the field. But it's then that we get to the real interesting bit, as Aaron thinks to himself, Wait, why am I even relying on them? At the end of the day, the only reason why I'm still alive is because I have the power of a titan. I am actually much more powerful than a vast majority of people here. So why don't I just transform and fight her here and now? Which is of course exactly what he'd end up doing in the far, far bigger story. Like we've heard him say many times before, how can those with power afford not to fight? For Eren, it has always been about this single principle. And surprisingly, despite Petra telling him to stop, Levi then cuts in, simply saying, feel free to do it. And as it turns out, he too apparently has the attack titan, as his next lines are effectively, no matter what you do, you cannot cage a beast. Which just so happens to explain Eren's character to a T. Inherently, neither the titans nor the shifters are in any way evil or monsters. But as Levi continues, the difference in their decisions comes from experience. Which, tragically, in Aaron's case, is not only filled with tragedy, but is also not even his own. Though when it comes to Levi, he basically just says, yeah, I don't know what the answer is, but just make a decision you won't regret. First off, I love how this is just a bit of a sobering experience where they explicitly say, yes, they do not know what the right call is. Keep in mind that Levi knows the plan, he has the authority to stop Aaron, and he can stop Aaron with power. But he never panders to him, he doesn't tell him to stand down or anything. He simply tells him, make a decision you won't regret. 
Which 2 is a very on the nose callback to the Levi OVA where the entire principle is, as the title suggests, making choices with no regrets. I'll keep repeating this, but if you have not seen it, yes, it is canon, yes, it is very good, yes, you should watch it. Though that is not where the scene ends, as despite, or perhaps because of Levi's blunt honesty, Aaron still considers transforming. That is, until Petra simply says, believe in us. Which is when we hear this organ in the background that, to me, is pretty purposely evoking a funeral service because, well, by trusting them and pushing forward, countless soldiers are dying behind them. So from Aaron's point of view, this choice is quite literally giving those soldiers a funeral. Though we then fade into a very convenient flashback where Levi joyfully talks about how he might have figured out a way of stopping Aaron without killing him. Which is also when we get what is perhaps one of the greatest Levi lines ever. In fact, they'll probably just grow back lizard style. Creepy little bastard. <laughs> I'm guessing a number of you who are sitting here watching these who knows how many hours long videos on single episodes of Attack on Titan have also watched both the sub and the dub of the series. And I mean, I think we can all agree, hearing Matt Mercer's stone cold voice talking about how Aaron's a lizard is more than enough to warrant a dub. Like, come on, this is brilliant. Jokes aside though, as per usual, let us return to our ever-present Chekhov because once again, this flashback isn't just here to make me giggle about funny lizard boys. Instead, it is a very explicit reminder of both Titan regeneration and, more importantly, the fact that a human shifter can be retrieved from their Titan. An assumption that this entire mission is based on, and one we haven't actually seen thus far. Keep in mind that in every single instance where Eren has used this Titan so far, he has always come out on his own. Oh, and of course, Hanji is just excited to cut Aaron open a few more times because of course she is. Though another thing that's easy to forget with just how normalized these Titan battles become later on is the transformations aren't as simple as getting a Titan and poof, you're a Giga Chad now. In an attempt to understand how his power even works, Aaron tries to transform but fails multiple times. Which is of course where we get our second meaning of the title with Aaron repeatedly chomping down on his hands. And here, I think it's worth noting the dissonance and poor like music here. <laughs> On initial viewing, I always viewed it as, oh no, is the mission doomed? Are the Titan powers somehow random? And that horror music just spoke to this apparent failure of the scouts. But now in retrospect, I can't help but notice the horror of the act itself. Let me put it this way. Can you imagine yourself just repeatedly biting your own hand to the point that it's bleeding? Sure, it worked a couple of times, but now it doesn't. And no matter how many times and how hard you keep trying, nothing happens. Neither regeneration nor a transformation. And so, with us now knowing where his story goes, this dedication of his just seems that much more disturbing in hindsight. But whatever the case, another interesting angle we see here is Aaron being a little taken aback by how casually everyone takes this failure. Which then leads him to suspect that maybe they're actually relieved that he can't transform. There is a very, very long and complicated discussion to be had here, but it just raises the conversation about rejection of change, even if it brings long-term benefits. Everyone here is well aware that Aaron's Titan plugged the wall. They are more than aware of the practical benefits he might bring. Not to mention the fact that they are clearly being attacked by an enemy with the same exact power. But for many, change is scary. Very scary, in fact. Especially when it comes with potential problems for them personally. In this case being, well, you know, being eaten by Eren. So yes, as much as a Titan buddy might benefit everyone here, they simply wish to maintain the status quo. And because I need to farm out engagement on this video, by the way, like and subscribe if you haven't, I will also mention the two letters that will send shivers down many people's spines that very much embodies this situation. A. I. Though before we dive deeper into what this entire Titan mastery means in the bigger story, we get another scene to further characterize the scouts and, more importantly, Levi. We see Aaron brooding over his failure to transform, and notice the very chaotic and almost dissonant music accompanying all of these scenes, which I think just perfectly encapsulates the entangled web of thoughts within Aaron's mind right now. How is everyone here so calm? What happened to my power? What happens now? Will they kill me? All of these thoughts are clearly swirling in his mind, but he then drops the spoon. Now, I know this is a stretch about as big as Aaron's founding titan, 
But there is one specific superstition about dropping a spoon. One which says that when you drop a spoon, a woman will come to visit you. And well, as Aaron reaches for the spoon, he suddenly begins to transform. And you know, Ymir does sort of make the Titans, right? Okay, I admit that is way too big of a stretch and frankly makes no sense, but hey, it's fun. Though what is easily my favorite part here is what we see next. Because obviously, Aaron is absolutely stunned, simply asking, what? Why now? But he then hears Levi say, calm down, standing right behind him, to which he instinctively apologizes, clearly assuming that he is the one being spoken to. But as we turn around, we see that, no, Levi never spoke to him. He was standing in front of Aaron's Titan, telling everyone else to stand down. This, of course, immediately puts Levi on an even higher pedestal, with him not for a moment being shaken by what just happened. Even among the elites of the elites, his composure is still unmatched. And of course, we'll get to see this plenty more times in the future, with him being Erwin's right hand, even in the hardest of decisions. Though from Aaron's point of view, suddenly the people who just seem to at least somewhat accept him once again turn on him just like when they were faced with the petrified captain after Trost. And before we get to what all of these transformation shenanigans means, we jump on over to the mid-cards which just talk a little more about the smoke signals. Nothing groundbreaking here, just a reminder of what the different smoke signals mean as they would once again become very relevant in just a couple of episodes. Returning to Aaron though, obviously everyone is still very much worked up over Aaron just literally exploding while they're casually eating, and so they demand answers. Though this whole dispute is then interrupted by Hanji, who rushes out and immediately goes to touch Aaron's titan arm. But of course, she gets burned right away and pulls away saying that it's hot. Again, I'll check off. The whole burning away into steam aspect is nothing new, we've already seen it. But it is just a reminder because, hey, that's exactly what will happen with Annie's Titan. Though the super interesting thing here is the fact that the Titan arm picked up the spoon without ever so much as scratching it. Which to me, brings this previously unexplored dimension to the Titan's power. Thus far, when it comes to the Titans, it's been all about brute strength. Be it breaking through the walls of Shiganshina or lifting boulders or wiping out countless soldiers. It has all just been raw power. But suddenly, we see that they are in fact capable of much, much more precise movements. Which both speaks to the fact that, again, inherently, the Titans are not some beasts that just take over your mind or anything like that, but also plants the seed in your mind of, well, okay, if the enemy shifters have such great control over their Titan bodies, what else might they be able to do? And before we return to the Titan analysis again, we jump on over to Levi and Aaron who are sharing a few words in the basement. It's nothing groundbreaking, but the conversation they have here has always really resonated with me. Aaron says he never realized that the others had so little faith in him. But Levi then responds by saying, Yeah, I picked them exactly because they are such people. You need proactive people to keep each other alive. Aaron might be an ally on paper, but if he becomes a threat, they need to act. They are loyal, but not blind. And this is a mantra I seriously think people need to hear more often. Without getting too preachy or trying to act like some life guru, because let's be honest, I'm a mess, I think everyone should try to surround themselves with people who actively do challenge them. If you ask me, the best friend you could ever have is someone who will call you out for doing something dumb. They won't try to dance around the issue, they'll be blunt and, yes, sometimes rude. And in the context of Attack on Titan and this military unit who constantly puts their lives on the line for each other, I think this brutally honest attitude toward one another is the absolute epitome of trust. And to drive home that point, Levi also adds, None of them want to kill you, I bet each and every one of them felt bad about having to turn their blades against you. So again, it's not that they're emotionless, it's not that they don't care for Aaron, it's the complete opposite. It's exactly because they have this immense trust that they can hold each other accountable, no matter what it takes. Though they are then called by Hanji, who also knows that the spoon was not at all damaged. It's as if Aaron was simply reaching out for it and his titan appeared to help. Which brings us to the second major factor in transformations. You need to have an open wound and a clear intent to transform. Which one, explains why Aaron just never randomly transformed into a titan when he was younger. Two explains why Aaron's Titan only started to appear recently as he was now explicitly fighting for his life and had a clear intent of trying to protect those around him. Three, if we jump forward in time, also explains why Reiner had this incomplete transformation, as he had given up at that point and so lacked a clear intent. 
And finally, returning back to Season 1, also establishes the somewhat chilling realization of, wait, if Aaron is having this much trouble even learning how to transform, just how experienced are the other shifters to appear and disappear entirely at will? And now that we know that even something as precise as picking up a tiny spoon is possible for a titan, just what might we be in for? But of course, it is not all doom and gloom, as the soldiers then realize that it wasn't Aaron actually going against orders. And as a small gesture, they then proceed to bite their hands, saying that it hurts like hell and are surprised that Aaron is just doing it on a whim. And then just saying, we made a mistake, this is our way of apologizing. So again, challenge each other, apologize when you're wrong. A simple system that will quickly show you who your true buddies are. And on that, relatively wholesome note, we of course return right back to the battlefield as we once again hear, Aaron trust us. And with that ever convenient reminder of how Titan powers work, we move into the final stretch of Irvin's scheme. The squad never looks back, despite Annie being right on their heels, they just keep pushing onward. Of course, this theme of always looking forward and even at death's door just pushing through is a constant throughline of the story. But I just find it so fascinating how much this same exact theme has been flipped on its head. We have gone from Aaron being the reluctant hero persevering against all odds, to him becoming this chaser. Some might even say it's perfect, down to the last minute. And with that, we can conclude our now three videos long journey of Erwin's smokescreen. They make it into this clearing and for a brief moment, all time stops as we realize this is it. All music cuts out, and as Aaron finally appears, we simply hear a command to fire, which is then followed by hundreds if not thousands of blasts, completely and overwhelmingly trapping the female titan. But once again, as we keep going, notice that the usual triumphant music never kicks in. We just pulled off the impossible, right? But no, when the music kicks back in, it is still uneasy. This is not over just yet. And with that, let us jump right into episode 20 where, once again, without ever missing a beat, we are dropped right back into the heat of battle. And just like with the ending of the episode we just saw, notice that the intense music never stops. Subtly telling you that, oh boy no, this is not over. As for the title of the episode, Irvin Smith. Obviously, this episode follows a very clear dual narrative of Jean and Eld both piecing together the absolute enigma that is Erwin. They fully realize that Erwin is thinking about 30 steps ahead, but at the same time, the sacrifices he makes are not lost on anyone. Which also begins to lay out this angle of, even within the walls and among the soldiers, we are not all singing Kumbaya together. No matter how intricate and well thought out these plans are, they all still involve a lot of human sacrifice to pull off. Which again, just creates this cognitive dissonance of all of them clearly understanding the value in Irvin while at the same time thinking, well, he is always safe, he's the planner. But when will it be my time to be kept in the dark and just be crushed? And in a broader sense, one thing I always adored in Attack on Titan is that it was never afraid of leaving the main cast and focusing on these various supporting characters. That isn't to say there aren't many other anime series out there that don't do this. But a vast majority of them are much more linear in scope and very, very rarely leave the main character. Attack on Titan, on the other hand, even as early as this, was already hopping around between different squads. And now we're getting multiple back-to-back -back episodes where Eren is simply the observer and the main player is in fact Irvin. If you really want to boil this entire thing down, Eren hasn't really done anything in like five episodes. He's just riding a horse, right? But I digress. Moving into the episode itself, we see the Levi squad keep pushing on, with Petra and the tongue-biting guy, whose name I still don't want to try to pronounce, both telling Aaron to stop zoning out and that they still need to go further ahead. On initial viewing, of course we just read it as an extra safety step in case anything goes wrong with the female titan. But with the benefit of hindsight and how this entire thing is being framed, we of course know full well that they're in fact expecting something much, much more. Because don't forget, Annie was never the original target. Though as Erwin gives another command to keep firing on Annie, we see the scouts on the outskirts of the forest react to what's going on. With most of them obviously being a little lost and scared as to what is going on here. 
Though from a realism point of view, a detail that I absolutely loved here is that even despite the carnage going on, they never move. They were given orders, which at this point, most people here must have figured out that they are in fact a part of a larger plan. And so, they simply wait. Could all of those explosions technically be killing all of their allies? Yes, but that is not how the military operates. If there is a plan, the only way of seeing it through is if everybody plays their part. However, not everyone is reacting the same. And yes, I do realize this is hindsight being 2020, but come on, you can tell me Reiner and Bertolt are an extra sus when we see their reactions. Clearly, they both know that Annie is more than likely getting blasted into oblivion. Especially because they assume that those blasts are cannons, not the spear gun thingies we know they are. So from their point of view, Annie isn't being restrained, she is being killed. Which then brings up the question of, well, why didn't they help her? Well, firstly, in retrospect, we know that she didn't really need the help. No matter how bad the situation got, she did still get away. Though secondly, if you ask me, it's as simple as it not being worth it. Yes, she is their ally, but their mission isn't to get back alive. Their one and only goal is to retrieve the Founder. The female Titan potentially falling into the hands of Paradis is definitely worrisome, but not enough to outweigh what their original goal was in the first place. Which, I think is also exactly why we never saw them try to attempt to save Annie or anything like that between Seasons 1 and 4. Even if she did end up dying here, for the Marley squad, that would just be a casualty of war. Simple as that. Though with that, we then get to the whole dual narrative, as Jean and Eld basically finish each other's sentences about Irvin and this entire scheme. And it's also then that this alarming level of secrecy is somewhat explained. They come to the realization of Irvin only shared the plan with the survivors of Shiganshina, effectively saying that ever since then, there is a fair argument to be made that that's when they slipped in and is now working amongst them as we speak. And yes, you are right on the money. Two more, in fact. Though the music choice here is also excellent. That almost record scratch moment as we come to the realization of Wait, it's not over. There could be more. He's just so good. <laughs> and similarly, we also see them begin to question, was this all really worth it? Hundreds of lives just to bait out one of the shifters? And as they begin to quantify the sheer amount of loss, that usual horror, almost dissociative music begins to play as Armin jumps in saying, yes, it was worth it. <laughs> For a moment, he disconnects that emotional side of him and says that, in hindsight, yes, it's easy to poke holes in Irvin's plan, but he is not a prophet. He knew there was a spy and he knew that they were after Aaron, and so he did everything in his power to lure them out. Effectively, he was just facing a trolley problem. Sacrifice a hundred soldiers or potentially everyone within the walls. Don't forget that from people like Pixis, we already heard that the long-term outlook was very, very bleak. Trust or no trust, the walls were beginning to crumble. Irrespective of their recent triumph, another sizable hit from Marley would soon throw everything out of whack, and it would not be long until a civil war starts simply out of scarcity of resources. And as this conversation continues, we get to the absolute epitome of most of Attack on Titan's story. As Armin says, the reason why Erwin leads them isn't just because he is stronger or smarter than everyone else. It's because he was the one ready to sacrifice his own humanity to defeat the monsters. With these sorts of missions and him knowing full well that he is leading entire squads into their death, he became a monster to defeat the monsters fighting against them. And if that isn't the perfect encapsulation of the Attack on Titan story, then I really do not know what is. I often see people getting caught up in discussions about who was in the right in the story, etc, etc. But to me, that has always seemed like an extreme oversimplification of what the story is about. To me, the entire narrative has always been this cycle of hatred. Almost no one in this entire world hasn't had blood on their hands. Each and every character we follow did what they did to protect something or someone. In Attack on Titan, there are no cartoonishly evil villains. Just like the final openings would say, all I wanted to do is save your life, I never wanted to grab a knife. The Marley squad never wanted any of this, they just wanted freedom. Erwin never wanted to lead his soldiers to death. I mean, even take Armin, the one who people always call a softie. 
He nuked thousands of civilians. But still, they did the things they thought they needed to do. They became a monster because that is what they thought was necessary. So TLDR, Attack on Titan is depressing. And with that, so we then jump on over to the mid cards where we see some extra explanation about this new kind of weapon they are using to trap the female Titan. Again, remember that everyone else assumed that they were hearing cannons. Which also begs the question of whether or not this sort of weapon was used exactly because the Marley squad would have expected for cannons to be moved. And because they never were, the Marley squad never pieced together that this was in fact bait. And also note that, to me at least, this seems like a stepping stone to them later developing the much lighter and deadlier Thunder Spears. I know a few people who've wondered that if Reiner and Bertolt were the target of this mission, since again, no one knew about Annie, how would this sort of weapon even work? And to me, because of how the Thunder Spears work later in the series, I just assumed that these arrows would be enough to pierce the armored plates. With the Colossal, it is a bit trickier because of how the whole steam attack, which would have just blown all of these away, but for the Colossal, I would assume that the goal was effectively to trip him over and the scouts would then jump in, again, conveniently from the 80 meter tall trees. And of course, yes, this once again comes with the important caveat of them not knowing about the nuke. Though returning to the field, we see Mikay and Levi both go to strike at Annie's nape, only for her hands to harden and break their blades leading them to the conclusion that she can also have this sort of hardening. Though again, to Erwin, there is a very, very good chance that this is not over, and that there actually might already be another enemy headed their way, or at least throwing something new at them. And so with that assumption, he says, we don't have enough time. Prep the explosives, we are blasting her out of there. Something that Annie obviously realizes isn't exactly good. And another thing I loved here is the complete role reversal we see here. Thus far, these Titan attacks were nothing short of pure slaughter. Each and every one of them resulted in countless deaths, and not once did the soldiers even have the merest of opportunities to fight back. But now, the roles are reversed. And expecting the slaughter, the scouts have now tricked Annie right into their trap, and this primal desire for revenge begins to come through. And so, we see Levi say, In many ways, we're alike. I enjoy killing Titans too. And then, to effectively say, you, we know plenty about how your power works, he then adds, It's fine if I cut off your limbs, right? They'll just grow back. I'm talking about your human body, by the way. And immediately, Annie realizes it is game over. They don't plan on trying to kill her. They know how her power works. They plan to cut her out. And likely knowing how the Marley military operates, she probably also has a pretty good idea of what interrogation might entail. And just like a cornered beast with no way out, she simply lets out a howl. And while at first, everyone just writes it down to being just that, a scared beast, Mikay awakens a stand power of smell and then says, Dozens. There are dozens coming from all directions. And just like that, for the first time ever in this plan, Erwin, and also we as the viewers, are completely thrown on the back foot. And so, just as he gasps, the now very familiar Colossal's theme kicks right in. And exactly like Armin said, Irvin's a commander, not a prophet. He simply could not have accounted for this sort of ability. And so suddenly the plan of keeping the Titans out, and whatever might want to escape in, completely backfires as the Titans that were just used as a wall now come flooding right into the forest. And yes, if you really want to embrace the tinfoil, there is some very interesting mirroring going on here as well. The Titans were used as a wall of sorts baited by the scouts hiding within the trees. And now with this howl, the so-called wall falls and they begin swarming inside. But um, when we replace the walls with the walls of Paradis and the Titans with the Colossals hiding within the walls, well, a very similar howl let them free. Only there, instead of swarming inside the suspiciously round forest, they went into the opposite direction, crushing everything that lies in their way. I know it's a stretch, but come on, you gotta admit, that fits so well. And another neat detail here is what Sasha says, because her intuition is also right on the money as she describes this sort of scream like a dead animal with nothing to lose. And we then see exactly that, with Annie now throwing literally everything she has at them. Irvin's forces are forced to think on the move. Only problem is, normal logic does not apply here. 
The interceptory positions Irvin had set up are just completely ignored by the Titans and they head right for Annie. And so suddenly, the Elite Squad is told to do the complete opposite. Protect the female Titan at all costs. And oh boy, I've talked about the animation of these early battles before, but this payoff we see here is such a far cry from everything we've seen so far. It is just pure bloodshed on all fronts. These are all elites after all. And with us now entering into what is yet again entirely uncharted territory, we see their absolutely unprecedented power on full display. And what we see from Irvin here, I think showcases just that. We see him just standing there and clearly continuously running countless potential scenarios. And so, he calls for a retreat. The plan worked perfectly thus far, but again, there are unaccounted for variables, and in this case, that was Annie's scream. Yes, the plan was about capturing a Titan, but Erwin is also fully aware that they can't stop Annie from being devoured and that they need to prepare for what comes next. And so, despite everyone, including Levi now asking, so all of this was just for nothing, we simply give up? Erwin never falls for that sunk cost fallacy. The losses they suffered aren't lost on him either, but if they keep going, it will result in nothing but pointless death. But one super important detail here is that as we linger on Irvin, we see him watch the smoke, remember the Colossal, and then tell Levi, wait, do not gather your squad. Go resupply first, replenish your blades. And notice how this command sharply cuts through the somber music that was just there. Almost as if Irvin's command itself cut through the very perceptions of what we're watching and set us back on the true path. This is not over, and Irvin knows it. And with that, we enter yet another stage of Irvin's plan as a blue smoke is fired off, formally signaling a retreat. And to yet again bait us into a false sense of security, mankind's counterattack begins playing once again, almost as if to try to tell us, yes, please believe us, the mission is over. And to hammer that home even more, the elite squad then begins to tease each other about peeing themselves on their first missions. But again, this is Attack on Titan. And so, the ever-peacefully beautiful counterattack slowly fades out as we see a green smoke fired off. One that of course suddenly means a change in course, not a retreat. And with that, we finally jump back to Erwin where he begins to explain his decision. They never saw the body. Assuming that they are in disguises and regenerate just like Eren, they will not stand down. Instead, their next target will be exactly the same as it always was. The Levi Squad, and more importantly, Eren. Which is exactly why Erwin sent Levi off to resupply. And again, remember that Erwin also suspects even more traitors in the midst, as the information that led to Annie's capture ultimately came from one of the scouts themselves. In case you missed the last video, that was Reiner, he outed himself like 50 different times. But to Erwin, it is now clear that this mission is only going to get more and more complicated, and once again, they are now the ones playing catch-up. And it's as he says this that we hear the same Death Note-esque biblical music kick in, as Gunther is cut down by what seems to be just another scout. And on that, once again cliffhangery note, those are episodes 19 and 20. This was a long one, but we are now entering the climax of the first mission, so I think we're going to be back to solo episodes for a few of these final ones. But again, only time will tell. Whatever the case, we've been here for way too long as is, so I hope to see you back as we enter round two of our fight against the female Titan, and of course, continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Funny story, I was re-watching the season 1 finale episodes a few times while working on future scripts, and uh, I may or may not have ended up watching the entire show for the 300th time, but you know, my procrastination aside, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, Jeremy Dunham. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!